Welcome to episode 76 of the Civil War Breakfast Club podcast, joined once again by my co-host Mary, the only woman in history to watch a silent movie and wonder if she'd gone deaf. I'm only a grain and white, <laughs> pasty-faced video named Darren. Hello, Mary. Oh my God. How are you? I'm good. Well, I guess we can start off by telling our listeners that we watched uh, Buster Keaton and the General the other night, a silent movie from 1926. Darren, is your, is, is your audio wrong? Is there something wrong with your audio? I can't hear anything. Why are these words coming across the screen? This is so <laughs> weird. Oh my God, it's so weird. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, we watched that movie. It was a good movie. I enjoyed it. It was that really was good, good. And I was doing some research about it afterwards. Um, it's apparently now one of, considered one of the greatest movies ever made. Um, it was. And I, I don't know. I loved it. It was really, it was a great story. Um, great Buster music. Did, Buster Gee did this a lot. Yeah. And I, you know what I love about him is just... What? the face he has on it looks like someone just asked like someone was like can you please drive me to the airport that's the face i just made that you just ignored <laughs> what the the <laughs> no i'm that's talking great, more great about audio, his, by the way no i'm to- talking more about his scowl that he has on his oh uh, <laughs> hey what, speak, speaking of scowls how's your tuesday going <laughs> Tuesday, we're at Thursday, although it doesn't I know Tuesday. It's, every day, every day's grumpy Mary's a, it's, we call it Tuesday. It's a, well, I'll leave that alone. But in any case. Bucker. Anyway, to our <laughs> listeners, if you have a chance, watch the general. You can find it yes. on YouTube. There's it different versions good. of it. But I think we're going to get into our episode. And I don't want to take over hosting duties from our um from our amazing host tonight, Darren. Oh, that's right. It's my it's my I'm the host. So you you keep quiet as I do this here, okay? Let's just like Buster Keaton. All right. Anyway, so what are you drinking tonight, Mayor? I am drinking um, Plutonian Sky, uh, made by Monocacy Brewing Company, which is in Frederick, Maryland. And uh, you and I were able to get there a few weeks ago. It's an amazing brewery, and it's not far from the battlefield. So if you all find yourself uh, visiting Monocacy Battlefield, go to Monocacy Brewing. Uh, It's a really cool place. They have some great beers. And usually they have a food truck there, too, on Saturdays as well. Go to the battlefield, grab, grab yourself a hoodie. You won't regret it. Anyway, yes. Oh, thanks. yes, get a hoodie. Yeah, anyway. Well, since you didn't ask, I'm I was about to. Out, what are you what are you drinking? I'm drinking out of focus uh IPA, which is from our friends at the uh, ABC, Appalachian Brewing Company on Gettysburg over there on Steinware. We were there as well. So we did a little beer adventure a few weeks ago and we grabbed a whole bunch of beers to um to bring home. So I think we need to talk about our mugs too, because I think we both have the same person on our mugs. Oh, that's a good call. Good call. So this is why you need to host more. Go ahead. What do you got? Um, yeah, it's, I have Uncle Blingy. Okay. General good. Sherman. Can't see it. Great. I dream of a brighter Atlanta. And I've got Sherman as well. It says Die Mad. Sherman is sort of quasi part of this. It's a tangential little line. He, uh, as, we, as of course, we talk about the Battle of Oklahoma, Mary. February 22nd, 1864. A little spills before, a couple days before that, too. Yeah. But um, this is... This is basically the tail end of the Meridian campaign. So, you know, we, we talk a lot about, you know, a lot of important battles, right? Um, that, that, that could overshadow, right? Especially cavalry battles. And Oklahoma is certainly one that does fall into that category. It's not as famous as some of the other cavalry battles, like, you know, like the Battle of Brady Station yeah. or Yellow Tavern, those type of things. But what this one really does, it cements the legacy of one guy in dooms another. It mm-hmm. cements the legacy of Nathan Bedford Forrest, who we're going to talk about tonight, in Dooms and Other of William Sewey Smith. Yeah, for Sewey Smith is for various reasons, though, that he gets, you know, not very good at the end of this battle. He does, and I don't look, I don't want to give away the ending, so don't don't get mad at me with the ending here. But this is going to be a hammer and nail Confederate victory. Yep. In my opinion, it's going to be Forrest's greatest moment in the Civil War. I would That's agree. just my opinion, not facts. That's just my opinion. This is a guy who was outnumbered three to one in this battle. Um, and he, what he did was put a real cramp in the dick of the Union Army. And this this Meridian campaign is what he I did. I love how okay? you put that. <laughs> but that's what that's what he did, though, right? Yeah. I mean, but, to, you know, to get the details on this one, we, we kind of have to we have to go back in time. To go, you know what I mean? If I could turn back time. <sighs> and we have I haven't sang before. in a while. 
I know it's been fantastic. Speaking of silent movies. Well, we could just we... play the Back to the Future theme, you know, the da 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 and I can't about, do it. How about the sound of silence? That's a good one. Okay. Anyway, right over your head. But we'll go <laughs> sound back and we'll talk of silence. No, you missed the point completely. But in any case, <laughs> but we had to talk about the fallout that came out of Chattanooga as to why the Union found themselves in Mississippi in February of 1864 as part of that Sher- uh, William T. Sherman's Meridian campaign. Mm. Or really what it was, was that that test run uh, to his march to the sea that would yeah. happen later. Yeah, and that's exactly right. what it, pardon? Yes. Right, right, right. But, you know, so we, 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 let's go back real quick. So in November of 1863 at Chattanooga, Braxton Bragg, okay, uh, that fun lover we've talked about many, many times in his army of Tennessee is going to throw away a solid victory at Chickamauga. Thanks mm-hmm. to several factors that, that we've discussed in the past. We're not going to go yep. into that whole thing again. But the fallout of this battle will be one that will change the landscape of Bragg's army for the rest of the war. It will directly lead you know, to Sherman's Meridian campaign that's going to take place in early of February 1864, right? Yeah, it does. Big picture, the Rebs, you know, they got 99 problems, okay? They really have two big ones going on at this time. The first problem they have following the Battle of Chattanooga is this that consistent problem of manpower in mm-hmm. Tennessee and Mississippi? Okay, ain't got enough guys. Okay, yeah. Since the since the Battle of Fort Donelson, in February eighteen sixty two, they lost an amazing one hundred forty five thousand casualties. That's how many guys they lost. Yeah, they're they're basically okay? bleeding men, like, right? or as my father would say, a shit ton. That's, the phrase <laughs> that's actually use, what okay? my dad would say too. Okay. Probably must be, must be an old man thing. But but but, but before we t- so that's a big problem. Before we talk about Oklahoma, though. You know, it is important to discuss how Nathan Bedford Forrest got there because yeah. because we got to talk a lot about his recruiting and, and how he trained this army. Um, but, but before we get to that, the other problem we, we talked about in this area, because we're, we're going to hit these two big problems, a manpower problem. And the other one is that is the lack of manpower in that crucial area of a place called the Mississippi Prairie. Now, yeah. this was, was the, the breadbasket. Of Mississippi, it had mm-hmm. the livestock, the corn, the ho hos, all the stuff you need a growing boy needed in that area. The ding dongs, but um, but the Union presence in Chattanooga, in that shrinking number of Rebs, made this area extremely vulnerable to a Union attack. Yep, it right? did. And like you know, Forrest and Bragg have that kind of falling out, and that post Chickamauga, and that's how he gets to being where he is because it's basically one of these things where we are not working with each other anymore at all no we can't the whole thing's falling apart so you know to defend this area which became a real urgency for for jefferson davis he's going to put a guy named stephen dilley we've talked many many times in charge to defend this area and he's going to become the commander of northern mississippi okay um stephen dilley will move his command to a town called Oklahoma, mississippi and set up his headquarters there. Okay, so he's there moving the chess pieces on the board here, right? When Davis asked Stephen Lee to take this post, okay? Yeah. He asked Stephen Lee to give him a wish list. Just what do you want? Tell me what you want. I'll try to hook you up. He requested a bunch of things, okay? He, you know, he wanted the usual stuff, arms and men and Rosewood's clown, all the stuff that they're <laughs> going to need, right? But he wants, he, he, he really needed somebody, an officer, that's going to increase morale and fire up these troops. Because don't forget, they just got whipped at Chattanooga. There was all kinds of bad news coming for the Confederacy. Yeah, They needed somebody. And what the, what Lee asked for specifically was he wanted Nathan Bedford Forrest to help his defense, the Mississippi Prairie. Yep. And I, I know where you're going to go with this for a second. There's, there's, a, there's a problem, though. There's a problem, Mary, a problem, okay? There is. The problem is Forrest at this time was part of Braxton Bragg's Army of Tennessee. But fortunately for Stephen DeLee, Forrest, like many of the people under Bragg at the time, wanted to GTFO away from Braxton Bragg. He he did. So yeah, September 28th, Forrest receives orders to turn over his command to Wheeler and take a 10-day furlough. Um, or part of his command to Wheeler, take, he has to take a 10-day furlough. This is post-Chickamauga. Um, October 3rd, he gets an order from Bragg. The general commanding desires that you will, without delay, turn over the troops of your command previously ordered to Major General Wheeler. So all of his command. Wheeler and Forrest do not get along. Bragg and Forrest do not like each other. This is one of these mean girl situations in the Civil War that we see many times. But, you know, like I said in our episodes about Chickamauga and Chattanooga, 
the army of Tennessee at this point has more drama than an episode of Dallas. Um, and it's got about probably as much intrigue as well. Um, but Forrest is basically holds out his F this card and he takes it quite personally that Bragg is doing this to him. And we really don't know what happened. I don't think we ever will, but there is a, you know, there is a letter apparently out there that may have may or may not have been sent to Bragg. These things that Forrest said may or may not have been sent in, said in person. We don't know. Either way, um, Forrest is not happy and he definitely at some point speaks his mind and someone probably writes it down. And uh, he basically ends the thing by telling Bragg not to come near him again or else it'll be at the peril of yeah. his life. Um, but Forrest ends up leaving Army of Tennessee, which is exactly what Braxton Bragg wants, which is exactly what Nathan Bedford Forrest wants, and which is exactly what Stephen D. Lee wants. But Forrest um, does not get the command that he wants. He's actually not given all the troops that he needs no, for this. And it's funny you mentioned that the whole thing, there's all kinds of urban myths about what, what happens, yep. but suffice it to say, Forrest doesn't like him. Let's just leave no. it at that. Whether, whether he yep. wrote a letter, sent a smoke signal, went on the TV show and phoned a friend, whatever the hell he did, he did not like Bragg and he wanted to get out. Yep. Now, Forrest, you mentioned before, but I'm actually, I mentioned before, third person here. He, you know, he was someone who the troops liked because he was fired up. Yeah. Forrest, he's going to, he's going to uh, write to Captain John Morton, 1864. He's going to write, John, there is no doubt we could wipe old Sherman off the earth if they gave me enough men and enough guns. Okay. Yeah. So this is a guy, we talk a lot about the Sherman Forrest thing, but this is a, this is a guy that Sherman was someone, he exuded confidence in his guys. Right. Yeah. So basically, you know, eight August, October, 1863, that you were just talking about, Davis is going to notify Nathan Bedford Forrest that he wants to meet with him in Montgomery, Alabama, right? Yep. And they want to discuss their future. You know, sit down, son. What's on your mind? What do you have to talk about right here? So I don't want to be with fucking Bragg anymore, <laughs> Dad. Okay, don't make me go with him. Seriously. He's looking it's at me. It's like Man, siblings crazy. fighting. Right? But October 27th, 1863, this meeting is going to happen. What's interesting about that day, Mary, October 27th, okay, is – um. This is the same day that a lot of other things are going on in Western Tennessee, which is kind of foreshadowing of what's going yep. to happen later. Yep. Enter a farmer named Colonel Tyrell Bell, Ty Tyree Bell. We're going to talk about him in more detail later, but at this time, he's he's recruiting this big army in, behind enemy lines. At the same day, he's meeting that that Davis is meeting with um with Forrest, and we just hint at this because it's going to come out later on a little bit yep. later. But at this meeting with Davis and Forrest. Um, the rebel president is going to ask Davis if he wants to work with Stephen Dilley. Okay. Yeah. And, um, and so Dave Forrest probably almost concussed himself nodding so hard. Yeah. Hard, <laughs> right. So he, he's going to do it. But what you just said before, Davis is going to go tell Bragg that he's taken Forrest and he's in Bragg is going to, is going to agree to release him. Yeah. But he's going to say, I'm only going to let him take 300 guys. Yeah. That's all he I still can gives spare, part. Right? And that, that's like, that's not like to help Bragg out, you know, leading into what's going to be the battles for Chattanooga in November. Well, don't forget it, that he's still with the manpower issue too. So you can't, well, yeah, you but can't he, bring... he wants to like, he wants to take a slight at Forrest because he saw Forrest as being this kind of like gallant cavalry guy who was like kind of like Jeb Stewart getting his names in the paper, so to speak. And he saw Wheeler as like, but Wheeler was like, I think his little like lap dog, like Bragg's lap dog in some ways. And he just kind of did what Bragg told him to do. Well, you, and, can, you get two, two alpha dogs, a guy like yeah, Forrest, who's a, a mean Wheeler prick, and a guy who calls himself war child. No surprise. These guys don't get along. Oh, this exactly. Guy was not, they were not allowed to touch his drum set. I'll tell you that right now. I don't care what the hell happens. <laughs> they, they were not allowed to touch that. But, but so he does agree to release these 300 guys. And he's going to let them go. So Forrest is going to leave and he's going to move to Oklahoma. And he's yeah. going to get there on November 24th of 1863 to join lee no wow, which is a day he, before the day the day before the battles of chattanooga start happening and the greatest day in american history i would agree with that okay agree with in that. any case there's no word that when, when forrest got to Oklahoma that he had a condo made of stona be cool if you know what that one meant what i meant for that God. but regardless okay i'm just saying okay but he's down here now okay and the first thing forrest is going to do when he gets to Oklahoma is he's going to recruit 
And he's he's really hoping that Lee, I mean, is hoping that Forrest's reputation, which really preceded him, is going to really help that recruiting. It's kind of like your, your yeah. football college team gets a brand new hotshot coach and all the kids want to play for. That's that's what he's kind of hoping for. Yeah, they're, they're, um, but Lee is really happy that Forrest has come down to command um, or, you know, come down to join him. And Stephen D. Lee writes him and says, um, you know, I would feel proud of commanding or cooperating with so gallant an officer as yourself. It's like, dude, what do you like? You're commanding him. You don't need to like, suck up to him like well he's he's just happy he's got him okay now the first thing he's going to do he's going to recruit he's going to set up you know he's going to set up recruiting seminars balloons coffee yeah. the whole deal he's going to try to sign up sign up people to join his <laughs> army what he's going to try to do but yeah. the thing that the challenge is and, and he's going to end up with about 600 guys out of Oklahoma, but he knows the mother load is in western tennessee exactly. this goes back to bell we talked about yeah where tyree bell pulled two thousand people out of west tennessee for bragg Forrest also thinks they can go back to Western Tennessee and they can recruit and get that many more guys. Here's the problem, Mary. There's a problem. It's behind union lines. So what this is going to do is Forrest and Bell, because he wants Bell with him, yep. they're going to end up having to go behind union lines, recruit under their nose, and then get back. That's part of the problem. That's one problem. Mm -hmm. It gets, but, but wait, there's more. The other problem is this, okay? They're doing this around Christmas time. Yeah. And that's, an, that's a big deal because not only are they going to try to go behind union lines to recruit people, mm -hmm. they're going to do it around Christmas time. So these are, they're going to try to get these men to leave their families around Christmas. It's cold. And they know that if they do leave, they're leaving their children, their wives, whoever, in union-occupied land without them to protect them. So it's actually a really, really tough sell. But Forrest knows it has to be done. So he's going to end up with those... 300 guys he started with. He's going to yep. get 300 more in Oklahoma. And what he's going to do now is he's going to go with Tyree Bell. They're going to go to Western Tennessee and they're going to go get more. We're going to be, and I think it's important we talk a lot about this before yes. the Battle of Oklahoma because this is the army that Forrest is going to fight with. And he's going to fight with throughout the war after this. Right? Yeah, exactly. These are like raw recruits and stuff like that. And you know, the other thing too is like Davis in this meeting they had, Davis was like, oh yeah, I'll send you those weapons that you need. Um, Davis promises, promises he's going to, um, and the weapons never arrive. So some of Forrest men are actually going to go, as we will see, they're going to go into the battle of Oklahoma unarmed as well. Cause Davis never sends those weapons. Yeah. But as mm -hmm. you said, getting back to, you know, like he's, it's around Christmas time and he's got to go recruiting, but you know, because it's Nathan Bedford Forrest, you know, he's probably not going to have a problem like issue, um, recruiting these men. Um, cause that. Um, there's a quote here at the time, West Tennessee was full of little companies um, from 10 to 30 men willing to fight, but unwilling to go far from home or into the infantry, which is what Forrest said about them. So he yeah, knows he's got to keep them close to home, right? Like, he's like, how am I going to get this? But Forrest has that reputation, which men would rally around. And he said, I determined to cast my force or um, one, one man said, I was determined to cast my fortunes with the daring and dashing forest. He was constantly re receiving recruits wherever he went. Um, many old, um, and young soldiers joined him just from choice. Well, getting people, getting these men to leave their homes in that time of year yeah. is like selling ribs to a woman with white gloves that's how impossible this was <laughs> but 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 it was a real herculean task it really yeah. it's like trying to get people to join the indians and play baseball <gasps> for them they're never gonna they, that's how hard it is to recruit Just that i don't to make it real but but regard so we got to talk about the terrain okay now, let's remember a couple things one we're talking winter in, in western tennessee northern mississippi it's it's november december right and the but weather's it's still not cold. good it's not good so the separating line between the feds and the rebels basically was was the, the line that ran along the Mobile and Ohio Railroad, okay, yeah. which ran parallel to, to Mississippi and Tennessee state lines and ran from Memphis, Tennessee to Corinth, Mississippi, and was heavily defended by the Union. This was kind of that no man's land, right? And this is the where Forrest had to go across. So Forrest, as I mentioned, he's got 600 guys, and they need to cross this defended railroad just to get into enemy over enemy lines yeah. just to be able to recruit 
And so the guy he I mentioned before, he wants with him is Tyree Bell, right? Who agrees to go? And Stephen D. Lee says, knock yourself out. You be you. You take her the hell you want. Stephen D. Go. Lee is going to give Forrest whatever he wants because Stephen D. Lee is like, I don't know. Did you did he come across as like a fanboy to you? I mean, did you study the Battle of Tupelo? <laughs> <laughs> Stephen D. Lee. I'm just, I'm just saying, no matter what happens, everything's going to come out great. Put it that way. It's all oh, good. I know. But I mean, I'm like, like Stephen D. Lee is like a Nathan Bedford Forrest fanboy. Oh, he, he is. Like he's, he's, he hero worships him. He's like, oh, my God. You know, God, but, but, but <laughs> Bell is good. Bell's going to go first is what it's going to do. He's going to try and sneak back into Western Tennessee uh, to his place he calls Camp Bell, which is his recruiting area. That's what he calls it. He's going to make it there, and he's going to quickly spread the word that Nathan Bedford Forrest is coming, okay, yeah. to recruit men for his personal cavalry as he, as he done in Oklahoma. So you can imagine, you know, how excited people are. An Alabama Mary named Robert E. Curry writes to his wife describing Forrest recruiting tactics. This is back in Oklahoma now, okay? Yeah. Oklahoma. General Forrest uh, don't want no, no one going with him unwilling. If some of us don't pay him a visit in Alton, a Union prison war camp, we will be lucky. For I know our leader, the great go-ahead Forrest, is a rush man, and he is fond of danger. Okay, so John Johnston, okay, a recruit who, who he signed on there as well, he says, General Forrest is like a steam locomotive, trembling under the pressure of his own awful power, ever ready to move still only when constrained. So this guy's a bull in a china cabinet. And, and, but, mm -hmm. what, but what that does, though, is it brings people, don't forget, a lot of these guys, they're dealing with Grant and Sherman and yeah. all these people, and a lot of them mm -hmm. are, are going to be are going to be occupied, especially yeah. people in Western Tennessee. They're fired up to have a leader like that. So mm -hmm. on November 29th, Forrest is going to leave Oklahoma with that small force that we mentioned, those 600 guys, and they're going to head north towards that railroad during that really awful cold shit we talked about, that ice and snow and crap um, that's hitting the region around this time. So. By December 1st, they're already at a place called Ripley, Mississippi, which is about 50 miles south of the Tennessee state line. So mm -hmm. whether notwithstanding, they're moving, okay? Yep. To help Forrest sneak past that Union line, Stephen Dill Lee is going to create a diversion further up the railroad track. They're going to make a bunch of noise to get the Union Army who is defending that trail to go and head towards Lee. And by doing that, it's going to take the eyes off of Forrest, that area in where he's going to go through Western Tennessee. Mm -hmm. And that's going to happen on December 2nd, right? So by the 3rd, Forrest is already cr crossing the Hatchie River at a place called Bolivar, Tennessee. And he's going to find a ferry boat. It's not funny how life is. He's going to find a ferry boat. Yep. Um, and he's able to sneak into Tennessee and move into Jackson, Tennessee, completely undetected of the Union Army. He goes right under their noses. Um, and this is primarily because Stephen Dilley is the, creating that diversion. Well, and right? it's also because General Herb Herbert is not overly concerned either. Well, he, he, right. But here's the thing about Forrest, okay, is he's thinking one step ahead. He knows yep. that when he's in Western Tennessee, Stephen Hurlbut is going to figure this out. And he's going to know where he crossed. He's going to go defend where he crossed and catch him. So you know what, you know what Forrest does? He takes that ferry boat. He moves it. Because yep. he knows when he crosses, he ain't going that same place. He's going to go southwest. He's going to cross. So we'll talk about that in a little bit, right? So they're going to hide that. They're going to basically hide that ferry boat. And um, and so what will go on by December 5th, okay, Forrest is sitting in Jackson, Tennessee, and the recruiting effort is in full motion. He's promising yeah. money to all the good basketball players. <laughs> cars. Hey, he's doing whatever he can to recruit, Okay. Um, he has some men recruiting. He has other men keeping, keeping a, you know, keeping a clear eye, looking for federal troops to make yeah. sure that, that they're not watched. Because he knows the clock is ticking. He knows mm -hmm. he can't be there forever, right? Yeah. Most of these recruiting trips take place in these in the middle of the woods, in ravines, and streams. This is really sounds off the past. really fucking shady. Just picture him sitting there in a you know with a cigarette. Hey, buddy, want to go? <laughs> you, like, you like you like horses? You, want to, you know, you, you know, like swords, you like you guns. Know, he's, he's, he's in a you parking want... garage, you know, with the lights, you know, the lights turned on because the one spotlight. You want to see the world, <laughs> the world being maybe 25 miles from here. What do you think of sabers? You like sabers, kid? 
you know but so, then there's so, someone asked him like how many men are you looking to recruit about a million about a, about a million you know <laughs> <laughs> but 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 the thing about the forest mere presence is going to make their jobs completely easy yeah um because don't forget too in these people in western tennessee they're tired of of living under union occupied territory yeah. which is what they were so thanks to this he's going to quickly sign a thousand guys real quick despite the reservations of of the christmas time or even their families the other thing that he does is he has to pay for these people out of his own pocket yeah, because yeah, he, and he is he, the he, richest he, man. He's one of the richest men in the Confederacy. Is he not going into the Civil War? He, he was. He has that quote. He goes, "I went into the army worth a million and a half dollars. I came out a beggar." That's the quote he said after the war, right? So he, but it by all accounts, okay, this is his last. This is he, this he tapped himself out here, right? So because he's going to write to Joseph E. Johnson of all people, he's going to write, yeah. "I'm in need. I'm in great need of money." I've had to advance my quartermaster $20,000 from my pocket to subsist my command so far. So, um, and the records will show, like we said, when, he's, when the war is over, he's broke. Yeah. So he's going to take the last of his personal funds to fund this army, this group of people he's desperately trying to recruit in Western Tennessee to stop what he thinks is coming, which is Sherman coming to Mississippi, right? Yep. So now with this pretty good force, the next task for Forrest is to get these men, and like you mentioned earlier, these men have no weapons, they have no horses. No. Yeah, he, he has to get these guys back into Tennessee, back over Union lines. Tyree, Tyree Bell, he's not sitting around on a Friday night aimlessly doing nothing, Mary. He's trying, he's recruiting as well. Okay. His phone is ringing. Okay. He's going to also recruit a thousand guys. So by the time Forrest and Bell are going to be heading back into Mississippi, yep. they've got about 2,500 guys. They, so they, they, oh, sorry, go ahead. I was going to say, they went in with 600, came out with 2,500. That's how good this recruited trip was, again, around Christmas time, when yeah. these guys don't want to leave their homes in Union-occupied territory, who they were desperately afraid of leaving their families with. Yeah. He got that many guys. That's how good of recruit these people are. Yeah, but you got to wonder though if these guys are maybe deciding to join up because of what the result of the battles for Chattanooga and the Battle of Ringgold Gap has been. The fact that Bragg has been driven away from that key city, that maybe they're like, "Fuck, we got to do something," or these guys are going to come for us too. You know that, and they they know that Vicksburg obviously has already happened. But I think the battles for Chattanooga. Um, and, and wrinkled gap are probably having an effect on them as well as to to why they're deciding to move. Um, mm -hmm. But but Forrest says um, in December of 1863, he said, "I am highly gratified with my success so far. Uh, troops and men are flocking to me in all quarters." And um, like Forrest, basically, as as you've talked about, Darren, like he works his ass off to get these recruits. Um, has officers going all over the region to get them, and he's got enough to form the 16th, the 18th, the 21st and the 20th Tennessee Cavalry regiments. Mm -hmm. Like that is really amazing what he's managed to do. Um, and he does tell Johnson at one point, Oh, I'll have 8,000 men, which never well, happens. The thing about it though, is not only does he get 2,500 guys, you know what else he gets? He gets, 20, he gets, he gets 40 wagons. He yep. gets 80 mules, 200 pigs, 300 cows and a partridge yep. in a pear tree. It's Christmas time. So he has to get that too. Does he get IPAs he gets, or anything? I don't know. No, no, some Canadian took them all. But what happens is he ends up with okay. a whole bunch of stuff. Now it's around this time that the clock runs out and Stephen Hurlbut is going to learn mm -hmm. a forest presence in the area. He knew it was a matter of time. Hurlbut finally finds out and he's going to move quickly to bag him. Okay. So Forrest now knows he's got to go. So he's going yeah. to start to move this, this caravan, I guess you want to call it, right? Forrest will have his first brigade under a guy named R.V. Richardson, okay, in, up in front, followed by Tyree Bell's brigade. Now that middle brigade is going to have all the wagons because it's going to be yep. the slowest part. So you're going to have all that stuff in the middle, right? And then Forrest himself is going to ride in the rear, okay? Now Hurlbut is going to try to trap them, like we said. He assumes, like he should, that he's going to leave the same way. Right now, remember what Forrest had wisely moved that that ferry, that yep. pontoon thing, yep. down the river because he knew he could not go out the same way. So he's going to go further southwest. And he's going to cross the Hatchie, and then he's going to cross a place called the Wolf River. Right, and it's significantly more dangerous, but he has to do it. 
So he's going to end up moving that ferry to a place called Estranella Crossing. Yeah, that's where he's going to move it. Okay, and Richardson's guys are going to get uh, that elite element's going to get there the day before Christmas, December twenty fourth, and they're going to set up the ferry. And forest men are going to start to cross the river. But yeah. but what happens is, um, you know, who finds them is Benjamin Grierson, yeah, the Union Cavalry guy. He's yeah. gonna he's gonna he's nearby. He's going to get wind of Forrest Crossing. So he's going to send two of his regiments under guy Edward Prince down to chase him down. Now, by the time Prince gets to the spot in Estrella Crossing, Forrest has already basically beaten him to it and they start to cross. But there's going to be a quick little skirmish there, right? Prince is going to arrive and he's going to start firing on these, un- these Confederate Revs crossing. It's going to cause Richardson to dig in. He's going to send a message back to Tyree Bell who's going to send men forward. And even though not everyone has weapons, they are able to drive Prince back. Um, and it, it, the, in, at this point, um, the, the, they, don't, they don't sustain any casualties. The only mm-hmm. casualty that happened was Tyree Bell's personal wagon. He doesn't want to cross the ferry. So they're going to try to go right across the water. The water at this time with astronomical crossing is it's winter time. It's high. It's running fast. Yeah, they start going. Guess what happens? It gets capsized. It yeah. flips over, right? So the the the, the driver, or whatever the teamster, floats away. He's never seen again. He, they think he assumes he's drowns. God. Bell gets stuck, as does the the mules pulling this carriage. You know what happens? Forrest sees yep. them. He jumps on the water with a knife and he frees them. So that's that's yep. yeah, that's what happens. Well, the there. other thing Forrest does too is one guy said he wasn't going to get into the icy water, and Forrest apparently threw him into the river. Yeah, well, I guess so. God. so but <laughs> by this, by December twenty seventh, Forrest is safely back in Mississippi at back at Holly Springs. Okay, yeah. and now he has this new cavalry force, and now he's able to arm and uniform his men. Okay, he gets weapons from Leonidas Polk, who's sitting over in Como, Mississippi. So now he's able to have these 2,500 men armed and organized, right? And this is this is going to be the army now that he's going to use at Oklahoma and mm-hmm. that we'll talk about for the rest of this as well as the rest of the war. Yeah. And the other thing that Forrest is doing too as he's getting there is he's cutting the telegraph wires as well to fuck things up for the Union. Mm-hmm. So he's already starting to make life very difficult for them. Um, so Gerson basically can't get word out. What's going on? They're going to get to a place called Oxford, Mississippi, a big yeah. college town nowadays, Mary. And I get to tell this real quick story here was the story of these 12 deserters, which is a good, inter- very it interesting is. story. Okay. Yeah. So while they're in Oxford, 12 guys from this new cavalry decide to ditch. They decide to desert. Yeah. And it, like in most cases, they get caught. Okay. Forrest, you know, being Forrest, he wants to have him shot publicly. Right. Yeah, And it brought like an outrage in the town of Oxford. Everyone came out to beg Forrest not to shoot these kids, okay? He's, nope, they're going to die. They're going to get shot. So what he does, the day of the execution, he has them dig their own graves. He stands at the foot of the graves, and he has the firing squad ready to go. Mm -hmm. And he aims the rifles, and he's ready, aim. Right before he says fire, he stops, and he spares their lives. And he basically says, let that be a lesson to you next time. Next time people who deserve it, I'm not going to stop. So what, yeah. what does that do? It shows compassion, to these 12 guys, yeah. but it kind of brings that army cohesive, right? It so raises what he does, morale for them too. It, exactly. And I can only imagine the, you know, what's going through these people's head. I mean, oh my, my God. God. Yeah. Like then there, I've got a quote here from this, um, there were no more no more des- desertions, and the men learned that General Forrest was not cruel, not unnecessarily severe, but they also learned he would not be trifled with. So kind of like, you know, you do as I say, you follow me, but don't fuck around, and we're gonna be okay. Well, he he was a he was a heartless prick, no question. Oh, but he moment, was. But at this moment, I think he realized that he could do more. He he could look at the bigger picture and realize he could bring his army closer together yeah. by not doing that. So yeah. this he has his cavalry now in place. So he's back with SD Lee now. And this is when William T. Sherman's and his 35,000 man Meridian campaign starts going, right? It is, yeah. So we're not going to tell the whole story again. There's an episode from we Meridian, have a whole right? episode about it. But suffice it to say, Sherman expected Sherman was going to Meridian, Mississippi, and he's going to rip shit up. He's going to burn stuff. He's going to be Sherman. 
he expected his cavalry commander, a guy we're going to talk a lot about for the rest of this episode, yeah. named General William Suey Smith, to basically go along the trail of that Mobile, Mobile and Ohio Railroad, go east all the way to Corinth, and then yeah. work their way down and destroy stuff and meet him in Meridian. And then they're going to do that. That that was in a nutshell what Marina was, okay? He yeah. wanted Smith to lure out Forrest, which is he knew Forrest was there at this point, to mm -hmm. beat him and then go to Meridian. And then they were going to join together, have a big campfire, Kumbaya, and that was going to be it. Yeah, Smith but, but basically what, has one job, and that is to get General Nathan Bedford Forrest. Right. So real quick, I'm William Sowie Smith, Mary. He's another Ohioan, okay? Mm -hmm. He's born in 1830 in a place called Tarleton, Ohio. He was a career civil engineer, like a lot of these guys. He graduated sixth in his class at West Point. Yeah, that he's star, quite a That star-studded class of 1853, Mary. He's quite a talent. He, you know, he he's in, he's in school with with Burbsy McPherson and Phil Sheridan and guys like John Bowen. So he is in a star-studded class. But do you know what he was after, involved in surveying? Oh, we do know. I was going to talk about that. He he helped survey that bridge across into Canada that you like to cross by Niagara Falls. Yeah, it's probably one of the yeah. bridges I actually I cross at either Peace or Queenston Lewiston. So I think it's one of those ones that uh... he probably doesn't anticipate the extra weight of those beer cans you throw out the window, but that's <gasps> okay. He probably figured that out. But when the war breaks out, okay, he's going to join the 13th Ohio. Uh, this is in by June of 1861. He's already a colonel. Okay, so he's a mm -hmm. rising star in the Union yes. Army. He, got he also actual, looks like Shaggy from Scooby Doo. He does. Okay. He actually got his he actually got his star on April 16th, 1862, and he commanded the division of Vicksburg in the 16th Corps, which is why he was there, right? So once the Meridian campaign um, is going, he's named to command that cavalry force under Stephen Hurlbut, we just mentioned, and and what what really this what he does over the next few weeks is really going to define him personally, which is very unfortunate, but. Um, Sherman's going to get underway. Smith was to leave Memphis. Okay. With this, he has 7,200 guys. He's got a yep. lot of guys and they're well armed. Okay. They got, they this got good is, shit. You could not ask for a better cavalry than what William Soy Smith has. Um, these are guys that have been handpicked from the best cavalry men, um, you know, supposedly in the Un union army, but obviously it's just what's in the West, right? Like they're not going to go over the place. But they've got great weapons. They've got um, sharps, carbines. They've got Colt repeaters, and they've got Navy sixes. Their horses are very well rested. They're ready to go. Each man is carrying an extra set of horseshoes. They've got ammo. They've got five days rations and blacksmith equipment. Like all these guys are ready to go. And Sherman, um, in his memoirs, described them as the best and most experienced troops in the service. And Smith has Benjamin Grierson, who we've discussed earlier. Um, he's second in command, and Sherman refers to to Grierson as the best cavalry officer I had. So these are all guys that, like, well, they are like, you could not ask for a better setup to do what Sherman wants, which is to get Nathan Bedford Forrest. Um, so Smith has to get Forrest, do a lot of damage in North Mississippi, and then go 250 miles to meet Sherman in Meridian. Yeah. With the timeline that Sherman's getting mm -hmm. giving him that should be possible. But as we are going to see, that does not happen. And Grierson is coming off that fantastic Vicksburg campaign that he did. And he's, he's a guy who's got a big name, but for whatever reason, for whatever reason, Smith is late to leave Memphis. Okay. And that's yeah. going to be the, what dooms him. Well, one of the things is going to doom him, but that, yeah. that's, that's, that's what gets him first. Um, the other thing about him is he suffered from really bad arthritis in his hands at such a young age, which affected him later. Yeah. And who knows how that plays into it. But um, but he'll actually when this is all over, he'll he'll leave the army by the end of the year. He'll be done. Yeah. Right. And, and but, but the thing is, like Sherman, um, the one thing I want to mention is Sherman sets this up for Smith. Um, you know, he said that um Sherman says that Forrest was a constant threat to our railway communication in eastern Tennessee. And I committed the task to General William Soy Smith. And Sherman says, I explained to him personally the nature of Forrest as a man and of his peculiar, peculiar force. So he's probably explaining like, dude, these are like just like guys that are like they've been recruited off their farms and they're probably really angry because of the shit we've done. Um, so he tells Smith that in his route, he was sure to encounter Forrest who always attacked with a vehemence for which he must be prepared and that after he repelled the first attack he must in turn assume the most determined offensive 
overwhelm him, overwhelm him and utterly destroy his whole force. I knew that Forrest could not have more than 4,000 cavalry. So Sherman's going into this, setting this up for Soy Smith, like, uh, dude, basically you're going up against like a fucking demon. Good luck with that. Like, mm-hmm. I can't imagine what was going through Soy Smith's head when Sherman's like, you're going to have to do this and you're going to have to do this because Forrest is going to do this to you. Well, you know, people talk about the Meridian campaign as kind of the dry run to the marsh of the sea. Yeah. This is a 45,000 man invading force. This is more than just a little expeditionary force. Meridian's a yeah. big deal. So Smith, for the most part, we're going to talk about him, okay, with this, with what he does. Every single thing people accuse Sherman of doing, Smith does. Oh, and okay? he does it and like so 10 times worse, we'll, I think. We're gonna, we'll talk about it in more detail, but what, what Smith does going to Mississippi, okay, is brutal okay and we're going to talk about that so yeah. when he finally does get moving he's going to straddle that mobile and ohio railroad he's going to move right down the railroad he's going to start at collierville okay he's going to move east yeah. along that path and he's going to go towards corinth now they're supposed to follow the railroad tracks in uh, south when they hit corinth they're going to go south they're going to go to tupelo they're going to go past Oklahoma, then to west point and they're going to eventually meet at meridian that that's kind of the path they're going to go okay mm-hmm. now remember two He's going right through this breadbasket we talked about. That's why it's an issue. They're going through this Mississippi prairie, which the Union and the Confederate desperately needs to hold on to. This cavalry force that Smith is sending through there is going to be the strongest cavalry force that's ever going to go through that area in the entire war, right? Yeah. Smith has three objectives, okay? He has to destroy as much of the Mobile and Ohio Railroad and anything of value as he can possibly get. Okay, he has to defeat Forrest, and then he has to meet up with Sherman. That's his three things. He's got three jobs, yeah. Mayor. Okay, now despite having this huge numerical advantage, Suey Smith was very uh, scared of Nathan Bedford Forrest. Oh, and okay? he doesn't and his- leave until February the fourteenth, and he's actually supposed to meet Sherman in Meridian on February the eighteenth. You so, got to go two hundred fifty yeah. miles and do this shit. You good luck. Well, that's what we said. For whatever reason, he left late and who, what he does, right? Well, he's waiting but, for Warring to get there, right? And Warring shows but, up late and his horses need to wet, rest and all that other shit. But the countryside Smith's cavalry is going through is going to be extremely plush and rich in supplies. It reminds me a lot of when those Confederates went into Pennsylvania in June of 1863 and talked about how wonderful Pennsylvania looked. Yeah. That they went to this place. It was it was called the land of Egypt, is what the locals called it. Yep. And the soldiers' stories, like I said, are very similar to seeing these big farms, all this this beautiful territory, all these supplies, cows, all this stuff. But um, but while on this march, Smith and his men destroyed whatever they could possibly find. They burned cotton warehouses. They destroyed railroad tracks. Um, as they straddled east along in, in, along this railroad track. Now, the destruction around this area of Egypt, Mississippi, was so bad that it's virtually, is nothing existing There's anymore nothing from left. that era. It's all gone. One, one story that comes out of this is a story of a, of a rich farmer in, e, in Egypt named Isaac Jarman. Okay, Isaac Jarman, like many of the locals, he chose to stay back at his farm and defend his land. He was going to stay back with his family. He didn't want to leave because he was going to get plundered. Smith and his guys are bearing down on his property. Now, Jarman is going to stand in his front yard, surrounded by his family, when the troopers arrived. And he's going to start shouting them to get the hell off my property, get off my lawn, all the stuff you yell at the neighbors, okay? All those <laughs> things, right? It's going to get really heated. One of the officers is going to order him shot in front of his family, which he does, okay? So Jarman is going to be shot. One of his nieces is going to catch him, cradle his head as he's bleeding. The ground's frozen. It's a really oh shitty scene. But the men are then ordered to go inside the house and plunder the house and then burn it. Okay, that's what they're going to do. Now, when the men are inside, okay, guess what they find inside the house? A Masonic apron. Okay. Wow. So they, they bring it out to the officer who, sh- who ordered him shot. And the officer said, and I quote, if I knew he was a Mason, I would not have ordered him killed. But you know what he does? He burned the house anyway. Oh, my so, God. So, so the Jarman farm uh, in most of Egypt um, would be completely destroyed by Suey Smith along with that railroad track. And so they're marching along. You want to talk about a march to the sea. That's what this was. Well, I think, too, this when you think of stories like that and just, you know, we're going to talk more about this in a little bit. But I think this part of the Meridian campaign 
it somehow gets down to Georgia. Obviously, it's going to be in the newspapers, but I think this is what Soy Smith is doing here is why Sherman has the reputation he does going into the March to the Sea. Well, it's, so it's question this. This is but what you know, does it. But you know what this other does too to Soy Smith? This slows him down. Oh, so big at, time. So, so while he's supposed to be dealing with Forrest, he hasn't got to him yet, but while he's supposed to be getting to Sherman, his men are going hog wild and they're getting this bloodlust and they're oh, destroying everything. They so, do. So, so he's supposed to meet up with Sherman on Valentine's Day, right? Yep. On February 14th, right? Also known yep. as Hancock's birthday, Mary. And as well as the else? day that William Tecumseh Sherman passed yeah, he away. Does, he does. Not that day, not that, not this year, but later on. Okay. But but as he's going through this, it's slowing him down. They're gathering supplies, yep. they're gathering wagons, they're just burning stuff. Um and while they're, this is all going on, Smith is going to order his, his is going to order Benjamin Grierson, okay, to yep. send troops towards the town of Aberdeen, Mississippi, which is just southeast of Oklahoma. So he's sending troops part, troops out to, to to kind of scout. And the re, um, the reason is he wants to go to a local river called the uh, Tobigby River, and to yep. see if it could be crossed. That's what he wants to do, and to get to the Aberdeen area. And when he gets, when Grierson gets to Aberdeen, he starts to notice that this forest cavalrymen in the area. Okay, so um, by now, okay, Smith's cavalry has has arrived in a town called Prairie, Mississippi, which is about sixteen miles south of Oklahoma and eight miles southwest of Aberdeen. So they're they're moving along, they're getting yeah. there slowly but surely. From there, they're going to move to the town of West Point, about twenty miles south of Prairie. So you can see this, the Smith's destruction is starting, is, is slowing them as they're going, but yeah. they are getting there. Now, um, this movement was, was you know, he's, he's starting to move out because the movement is being driven by fear that um, that he's lost so much time to meet Sherman. Okay? Oh, big time. I, I think he gets so caught up with what he's doing that, and you know, like he, he was delayed waiting for Warring's men and all that. And they got like, they were way delayed getting going. Um, but just, you know, a few quotes of what's going on here. Um, so like as they move through the area, like Smith's soldiers, um, one quote said they seem to be possessed by pyromania. You know, that sounds a lot like Sherman on the March to the Sea. And another one, the sky was red with flame of burning corn and cotton. And then um, one of the Confederates, uh, Private R.R. R. Hancock, who was with Forrest of the Second Tennessee, he wrote, the night the whole country northward was illuminated by burning homesteads, cotton gins, um, corn houses, and stockyards, inspiring the Confederates with a passionate resolution to do all in the power of men to punish such an unmanly, heathenish method of warfare. So even the Confederates now are starting to notice what Soy Smith is doing, and they're getting riled up about it. And um, I think that says a lot right there when you look forward to the March to the Sea and some of the things that we hear about that and how much of historical memory plays into the March to the Sea and how a lot of what we're hearing here sounds a lot like that. It does, but it's around here when Smith realizes, shit, I better get going. So what he's going to do is yeah. going to order Grierson to meet him at West Point. Now, the problem they're going to run into is they sort of put themselves into a trap on being knowingly. So what they did was Smith is, is afraid of Forrest is nearby because he knows now Forrest yep. isn't far away. But the other problem he has is he backed himself into this area of Mississippi that's surrounded by rivers and swamps and streams that's overflowing because of the winter, right? So yep. he's vulnerable to an attack now. He put himself into he put himself into a fishbowl just by where he was. So for Smith, that pucker effect is fully going in now, right? Yep. He's starting to realize. Okay, Nathan Bedford Forest is not far. I'm in a place right now where I'm backed up to every river in Mississippi and every yep. stream that's all flowing. So he knows he's in trouble. So what happens? A group of forest guys, they're gonna cross that Tom Bigby River mm -hmm. and they're gonna be and they see the feds, they're gonna begin to follow them and stalk them and shadow yep. them. So keep an eye on them, right? And they're gonna stay on that right flank. Now, Forrest isn't ready to fight yet. He knows he's got a three to one man disadvantage, all right. But he also knows that he's got them in that watery area, that if he is going to attack, this is the place to attack. So February 20th, 1864, Suey Smith is sitting in his headquarters at West Point, okay? Mississippi, not New York, Mayor, okay? <laughs> so um, he's already a week behind, okay? 
and he was supposed to meet Sherman, you know, earlier, and he he ain't he ain't getting there, right? Yeah, so, and Sherman's probably like, what the fuck? <sighs> so Colonel Jeffrey Forrest, the younger brother of Nathan Bedford Forrest, yep. is going to have his men, he's going to position his men about three miles southwest of West Point in a bridge called Ellis Bridge. It's yep. modern day 50 if you're from Mississippi, okay? And the younger Forrest wants to hold this bridge. Now, that night, Smith is realizing he's starting to see the writing on the wall. So yep. he thinks it's probably best to get the hell out of here and start to withdraw from West Point. Because he's hearing these reports of forest men are slowly coming in now. And he knows that he's been slowed by these friggin' supplies and the men he can't control anymore. They're plundering yep. everything, okay? And he also knows he's pinned with all these rivers around him. So this has bad juju written all over it. He knows everything. <laughs> I mean, it just, he, he's just sitting there going like, holy shit. Someone drank Joe Boo's rum on this this campaign. Oh my right, God, right I was thinking moment, about okay? Joe Boo earlier with this. Okay. It's crazy. <laughs> but so on February 21st, okay, he's going to retreat back north now to Old Kelowna. And now Smith, he's knowing that Forrest is at Ellis Bridge, is going to need to attack him to give him his army time to escape. We see it all the time. You, you throw some guys at him, slow them down. Yeah. And he's going to order his men to attack and hold, try to hold Jeffrey Forrest there. This will be known as the Battle of West Point, also on the Battle of Ellis Bridge. But the battle is going to blast away for about three hours or so under uh, Jeffrey um, Forrest and a guy named Robert McCullough, okay? They're going to be able to force Smith's men back, which is no big deal because they were yep. falling back anyway. Um, and what this, this battle does, though, this marks the beginning of when they turned Smith back. So there's a yep. monument there, and it, it makes a big deal about it. But um, Smith is going to start moving back north now. And what Nathan Bedford Forrest is going to do, he's going to nip at his heels and attack his rear guard all the way back. And that, that's where, where it's going to culminate in the Battle of Oklahoma. Yep. And that's right? where, like, that's where they start going to. Um, and, and Smith is just going to, he, he's finally got it in his head. I think it's a combination of what, you know, Sherman has said to him, his own, maybe his own paranoia. And apparently his arthritis started flaring up again in his hands, but he is scared. And I think too, again, going back to what Sherman said, like basically Sherman's like, oh yeah, he's going to attack you, but then you're going to have to counterattack because he's going to want to attack you again. Like Smith is like, who the fuck are you putting me up against? And why aren't you going up against him? Because you clearly know him better than I do. So the next day is February 22nd, and this is the day of the Battle of of Oklahoma. So Suey Smith, his men are back at Oklahoma as Forrest's men continue to harass them. Forrest is going to rout Grierson's men uh, while they're falling back. So, and, and they're going to, Grierson's guys are going to go on a O.O. Howard like mad panic <laughs> run to get the hell out of Dodge. They're going to turn, they're going to That's run. That's our O.O. reference. Yeah, unfortunately. But they are going to rush back to a place called a Pontotuck Road, which is continually further and yep. going north, right? And That's where Forrest hit, wanted them to go, too. Right. They're being hit on their on their savannah and their flanks Ooh. every step along the way. Okay. They are. So Forrest has, has basically got them in a cauldron and pushing them towards this pond and yep. road. Now, Smith's going to get there. Okay. And they're going to arrive at a town called Prairie Mount. Fun fact, it no longer exists, Mary. That's it was it's long gone. And it's about six, it's, it's about six miles from uh, Oklahoma. Now, here the terrain changes. It, instead of flat ground. You start to have some undulations. You start to have some hills that's going to roll. Okay, rolling hills. Yep. And so what's going to happen is here, Smith is going to realize that they might be able to make a stand here. So they're going to get to a place called Ivy's Hill. Okay, which is surrounded by a woodlot. Here, Smith thinks this is a place that he can make a stand to at least try to stop Forrest, who's been on his ass the whole way. Yeah. The the feds are going to dig in. They're going to throw up rail split fences. They're going to block the. They're going to barricade the roads with, with trees to stop it from coming and they're going to wait okay now leading the rebel assault inevitably the rebs are going to come they're going to come they're following them they're going to be led by colonel jeffrey forrest again he's yeah. going to be coming okay now real quick about, about forrest okay um forrest father nathan Bedford forrest and jeffrey forrest died right after jeffrey was born okay yeah so nathan bedford forrest and really wrote he was 16 jeffrey. years older than him right he raised him like a son okay he was the baby jeffrey was the baby yeah. and he was the apple of nathan bedford forest eye he was okay jeffrey is going to lead this cavalry up this ridge 
towards this union line, Ivy's Hill, across a field from a tree line, okay? In the woods are going to be dismounted federal troops waiting about 300 yards away, and they're going to wait for the Rebs to approach. And when they do, they fire a wicked volley at them, okay? Jeffrey is going to be at the front of the line. Yep. He's going to be hit in the neck. And when he does, he's going to fall, and the troops are going to scatter and fall back, okay? The younger Forrest is going to spend the next five minutes of his life choking to death on his own blood, yep. okay, until he inevitably dies, right? Nathan Bedford Forrest is not far away. He's going to hear that Jeffrey has fallen, and he's going to gallop to the site, and he's going to get off his horse, he's going to cradle Jeffrey in his arms, and he's going to be crying tears in his eyes, the broken voice, Jeffrey, Jeffrey, okay? And he's going to be absolutely devastated, Okay. He's going to kiss his brother on the forehead. He's going to lay him down with tears in his eyes. He's going to call to a guy named Major John Strange to take care of his brother's body. Yep. Okay. At that moment, he snaps. Oh, he, it, he said he just. Cracker, okay. He, it said he just goes into this kind of like it drove him to temporary insanity that, mm -hmm. you know, it, his brother had just died in his arms and he's said to have killed like, you know, five federal troops. Um, and his horse at this point gets shot from under him. So he gets another one and it also gets shot. And that's when they give him his final, like his, his main horse was King Philip and they finally give him King Philip and King Philip is described as being completely fearless. Although when it's not a battle, he was kind of like, oh, whatever, you know, like laid back. Um, but this is a horse that like, and apparently horses are colorblind, but this horse could see like blue and he went. Like he was apparently, he would bite federal soldiers. He would stomp on them and everything. You know, he mm -hmm. was kind of the, that, that extension of Nathan Bedford Forrest's personality, but Forrest just kind of goes on this rampage after his brother has been killed. So he, he jumps on the horse, he pulls out his saber. And one of his troops said afterwards that Forrest's behavior was quote, so rash as yep. to savor madness. Right. So now Forrest, He's going to jump on the horse and they're going to go and they're going to go full speed at these, these federal lines. Smith's men are going to turn and they are going to run like freaking hell. Okay. Yeah. And Forrest is going to have 120 of his men on horseback chasing them. So they're going to keep going a mile or so up the road. The feds are going to try yet again to establish a defensive line to try to stop them again. They have 500 guys on this line to stop these 120. Now, Forrest is going to attack him anyway because he is in a blood simple sea red. Oh, he's got, you know, this temporary is temporary insanity, I think, because his brother's been killed, right? This is, this is a this is a Pat's loss of the Bill's anger situation. That's how mad they are, okay? Oh, I know so all about that. This is going to this is going to lead to one of the single bloodiest hand to hand combat battles in the entire Civil War, okay? Now, the Rebs are going to get pushed back. They're going to get reinforcements from McCullough, whose nickname was Black Bob, by the way, in case you're curious. I know, okay? yeah, like, what the fuck? Um, he's, just so you know, Black Bob, he got hit in the head. He had a bloody bandage. You know yep. what he does? He pulls it off and he holds it up to lead his men. Uh, yeah, I was reading that. Right? That's crazy. All I could think of is like, is, is like you know, Edward Cross or one, Henry Heath or one of those guys, right? Yeah, yeah. And he's going to use that as his guide on, as his flag. Must have been cool to see, actually, think yeah. about it. Um, and it's going to, they're going to keep hitting him. A union member of the fourth Tennessee Cavalry union guy, Mary, his name is Edward, uh, Sergeant Alexander Brandon. Um, he's going to be killed because he's going to jump on a mule to escape. You know what the mule yep. does? It runs right for the Confederate lines and they shoot yep. him anyway. Okay. He's one of 11 dead along with 10 unknowns still buried there. There's still gravestones up there. Right. But, um, Smith's men are going to, are going to, are just about done. When McCullough's guys hits, when Black Bob hits, they're they're done. Um, and you mentioned before, Forrest is going to keep going. He's going to have three sh horses shot. His first hor horse is going to take four bullets till he finally falls. Yeah. He's going to jump on a second one. It's going to be killed instantly with a shot in the head. And King Philip, his third that you mentioned, is going to jump on. He's going to get hit as well, but he's going to survive the battle as well yeah. as survive the war. But Smith ain't done yet. He's going to fall back one last time. Okay. Yeah. And he's halfway between Oklahoma and that Pentateuch, and they're going to be driven back again. And by now, it's getting dark out. And mm -hmm. Forrest is starting to run out of ammo, and he finally decides to call it quits because his men are just like, dude, no more. We're done. We've been going. So he's like, so he's he. So they're pretty much done. 
Suey Smith is completely, and his men are beaten, and they are freaking stunned at this point. What yeah. did they don't forget? They started with seventy two hundred hand picked, well armed, well fed men yep. who were going up against a guy's a third of their size that okay? have just been recruited. Right. A lot of them have new. just been okay. recruited, and they were beaten to a to a pulp. Now this they end up retreating all the way back to Memphis, and they are miserable. You can only imagine. They are panic stricken. Yep. Most of these men are both meet, beaten in mind and in spirit, okay? Smith included, right? They are yeah. done. Now, Smith's men, okay, they lost 400 men, okay? They lost an amazing 1,500 horses in this thing. That's a lot, okay? That That's um, a lot. <laughs> that's a lot to replace I mean, that's a, that's for horses. The, it's the, crazy. The, Conf- the Confederates lost just 150 guys, but of course, the most significant being Colonel Jeffrey Forrest. Yeah, yeah. You know, but the thing about it, though, is, you know, F- Smith is, is never going to recover from this. Because he's not. We, because we mentioned before, he leaves the army soon later and, and, and he's done. But Sherman goes to his grave hating him for this. Oh, he does. And there's a really great, um, I mean, Sherman's got a lot in his memoirs about this. Um, and I didn't get a chance to write this down. So I have to read from oh. Sherman's memoirs. Um, he said um, the the object of the Meridian ex- expedition was to strike the roads inland to paralyze the rebel forces that we could take from the defense of the Mississippi River, the equivalent of the Corps of 20,000 men to be used in the next Georgia campaign. And this was actually done. Um, but then he said, I wanted to destroy General Forrest, who was in a regular force of cavalry and constantly threatening Memphis and the river above, as well as our routes of supply in Middle Tennessee. In this, we failed utterly because General W. Sawyer Smith did not fulfill his orders, which were clear and specific as contained in my letter of instructions to him on January the 27th. Um, And then he goes on to say, General General Smith never regained my confidence as a soldier, though I still regard him as the most accomplished gentleman and a skillful engineer. Since the close of the war, he has appealed to me to relieve him of that censure, but I could not do it because it would falsify history. He but tries I'm, to let bygones be bygones and like, Sherman goes, go screw him. You know, I'm wondering that, if it's just because of what the destruction that Soy Smith did was more than what Sherman wanted. And that's why he had this reputation going into the march to the sea that I, I think here comes I think the red devil or whatever. Right. I, I think, I don't think it's any more than the fact that he wanted, he wanted forest. Oh, I he think, absolutely. I, wanted I think, forest. I think he, I think he knew because, you know, he had that quote when Sherman, when forest was in Western Tennessee recruiting. Okay. He yeah. Sherman knew he was recruiting up there and he didn't yeah. care. He said, for every man forest recruits, he will need one to guard him. Cause he didn't think those men were going to be any good. He thought they were going to be garbage. You know, these yeah. green troops, and it turns out that they weren't. Now, this is going to be a big part of his reputation in Mississippi and Tennessee. The, the, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of comes from this. But at the at the end of the day, what he has here is is Smith getting absolutely scuttled and destroyed, and really screwing up the Meridian, primarily for the fact that he got too over his head in the destruction and the pillaging he just got too caught up in that and that's what you know and the other thing too is he actually writes grierson at one point during this campaign um smith was really embarrassed by what his soldiers were doing and he said i am deeply pained to say that the operation has been disgraced by incent incendiarism of the most shocking kind meaning my men are out of control and i don't know how to deal with them and so that was a big part, you know, but, you know, Colonel Jeffrey Forrest, you know, you know, he, he gets, when he dies, he gets buried in Aberdeen. He had a fiance yeah. or a wife. They don't know what it was, but yeah, he, he gets buried there for a while. He gets moved to Memphis, but his gravestone's still there. You can go visit his oh, wow. grave if you want to go see Jeffrey Forrest, you know, whatever. But I mean, at the end of the day, what this did, this whole thing for Sherman was simply to really knock out the defense on the way to Atlanta. It's, it's, and it, it ended up being exactly what he wanted to do. But the one thing he didn't get a chance to do was he didn't get a chance to take out Nathan Bedford Forrest because of bad leadership by Suey Smith, yeah. who turned out to be a real bad guy in this campaign. 
He really, really did. And he, he went overboard in a costume and he put himself into a bad situation with the terrain and he led the, the lamb to the slaughter right into Forrest's lap and Forrest went at him. Don't forget, 7,200 men versus 2,500 green troops, yep. okay, who just got their weapons not long before that. And he's able to pursue them and he's able to slaughter them and to, to drive them back. So really at the end of the day, it, it's it really it really cements the legacy of forest in that region it, in really it and, it, and it literally ends the career of William Sui Smith who at that point don't forget sixth and West Point class of 53 a rising star in the army this is a guy who got that position ahead of Grierson who had that great campaign in Vicksburg that's who yep. this guy was and he and he just he got he got a little over his head and yep. it cost him and Gerson is the one that gets placed in command after this. Um, but Union Colonel Waring, um, he had this to say of it. The retreat to Memphis was very disheartening and almost panic-stricken flight in great disorder and confusion. The escort and part of the 12th Kentucky that were under forest drove our 7,000 men without difficulty. This expedition filled every Union man with burning shame while it gave Forrest the most glorious moment of his career. As you just said, like this is... This is Forrest's sh shining moment in the Civil War. But I think, too, um, you have to remember that these recruits that he's just got, you know, when he was recruiting them around Christmas time, they have just learned that Chattanooga has fallen to the Union. Uh -huh. And that's a huge thing. Like, you're going to go if you know that place has fallen. And I think that is probably um, a lot of the reason why these men went, because they uh -huh. knew that, you know, as of you know, you have these battles happening November 25th to, I think it's the 29th that, that Ringgold Gap happens. Um, and that city is gone. Bragg is retreating. He's going, he's starting to go into Georgia. He's headed towards Dalton that they've lost that city. And they're realizing, holy shit, the union army's here. We got to do something. They are probably more than ready to rally around forest for that uh -huh. reason. I mean, at the end of the day, Sherman's going to get to Atlanta anyway, and it's going yeah. to make a lot. Of, it's going to make a lot of it moot. But what it really does, though, it does it does show that you can have an undermanned army that mm -hmm. you can if you if you fight viciously and you pick your spots, you can make and you have a re, and you have a really good inspiring leader in that situation. You can do a lot. So, yeah. I well, you know, the other time good. that that happens, that's, that's what happens at that, that's what happens at Ringgold Gap. Yeah. Claiborne's Never. absolutely outnumbered and he beats back Hooker and he's able to, um, you know, hold back the union long enough for Bragg okay. to get those trains mm -hmm. close enough to Dalton that they have their, their supply and all that. So mm -hmm. absolutely. Like if you've, if you've got the right person in command, you can do it. I, I think, you know, I think Oklahoma is, is really an understudy, underappreciated battle. Yep, it's, it re, it's, re, it's really the, the Meridian campaign that the, the part of it that people don't really talk a lot about. If you're from that part of Mississippi, you know, the Egypt area in, in Oklahoma, of course, you're going to talk about it. But at the, but at the end of the day, um, it, it, it's, it's, it really it really tells a great story. So I, I'm glad we did this one. I'm glad Me we kind of finished off the Meridian campaign. So it's fun to talk about this. Um, and uh, I think I think we're ready to move on from Mary's. What do you think? I think so too. I, I just want to say I think that you know what happens in the Meridian campaign, especially looking closer at Oklahoma with what Sway Smith does. Um, clearly, what he did got in the newspapers would have been read about in Georgia. Would have been read about by people that are going to be along where Sherman's march to the sea is, and you know rumors and word spreads quickly even in that time. So I think what Soy Smith did probably factors a lot into the reputation that Sherman had going into the March to the Sea. I think it does. It, it, it is in the back of their minds because they're thinking, here we yeah. come again, same guy. This and is what I he's going to do. When you think about the fact that, you know, certain towns were left with just, I think it was like, was it Little Egypt was left with just two houses standing after he'd been there. Yeah, age and prayer was just gone forever. So yeah, what's coming up for us next, Mary? What's next? So next we are doing an episode. We are doing part one of, because March is Women's History Month. We are going to be looking a little bit, we are going to be looking a little bit more at women in the Civil War. 
Um, we are going to be doing part one of, you know, female spies and soldiers in the civil war. We're going to be doing that next week. And then we have a kind of sort of a secret episode that we're going to be doing. We're not going to release the topic just yet, oh, but hey. yes, we're going to be doing that. Um, and then at, um, after that, we're going to be doing part two of female um, spies and soldiers as well. Um, also, our round table is going to be, again, apologies, it's going to be pushed back by a week. So it will not be the 16th. I believe it will be the 24th. Um, just because we have some stuff going on and all that. So we're going to push that back and we'll let you you guys know the date for that as well. So yeah, that's what we got going on. We got a couple episodes for Women's History Month. Oh yeah, as well. March, we are in a book club month for us. So our book this month is Nameless and Faceless Women of the Civil War by Lisa Samia. It's a book of Civil War poetry about women we will be having our book club meeting on March the 30th at six o'clock via Zoom. So if you would like to sign up for that, info at civilwarbreakfastclub.com. Perfect, perfect. So, all right. Well, that's a good story, I think. I think we told the story pretty well. So we will move off to uh, to other things. So Mary, great episode by you. Always fun studying this stuff with you as well. You certainly you always saying? know your shit, so which is so always fun. So excellent, excellent. All right. So any final words from you, Fincheru, before we head off to the wild blue yonder? Well, thank you for being the awesome uh, podcast partner that you are. And uh, yeah, and thanks to all our listeners for your support, these 76 episodes. 76, we are on to 77. We're going to talk about some female spies, which will be great to talk about that. Yep. You know, have a lot of fun talking about that. So off we go. Thank you everybody for listening. We appreciate the support. We will see you all later and have a great week. Have a great weekend. And um, off we go. And don't forget, he had a condo made of stoner. <laughs> see y'all later. Da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-da-